and a good Monday morning to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join with us here for this Preterist Power Hour. I'm excited because we're beginning our fall season. We're falling back to Genesis uh, in our time together for the Preterist Power Hour. So I have a lot to say about that, and I'm going to go ahead and do that here in a moment. However, let me just go ahead and introduce our program this morning, introduce myself, and then start with some prayer, get us centered here, and then we'll move right along into our planned program. Uh, so you're tuned into the Preterist Power Hour. This is a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. And uh, we encourage you to go there and you can gain uh, information regarding the uh, the clarity we endeavor to provide, the healing we hope that you obtain, and the uh, strategy of our network, and ultimately the different efforts that we hope to bring forth. So um, again, powerofpreterism.com. Uh, of course, we encourage you, if you're on Facebook, like our page, the Power of Preterism Network, and you'll be able to tune into our Preterist Power Hour sessions. You'll be able to get notifications that are always shared through that uh, resource. And of course, you'll be directed to our blog. Uh, our blog is powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. And it's there that we put the different uh, videos and different pieces of information for your edification every uh, week and different uh, details that are important uh, as a part of our conversations and time together. So please visit powerofpreterism.com, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com and or like our Facebook page uh, that you will be blessed by. Uh, that being said, um, let's go ahead. Uh, well, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, and uh, it's my privilege to uh, offer up what I like to call a zeal empowered by knowledge to the benefit of others. And, uh, you know, just the energy God gives me uh, through all that I've come to know about him, know through him. And it's my goal to bring that forth and to bless others with that. So uh, that being said, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the Lord. Let's praise him for what he's provided, uh, the insights that he continues to bless us with, as we would know nothing without him. And let's, of course, pray that he goes before us in our discussion and blesses us uh, with our, in our time together this morning. Mighty God, we do thank you. We praise you, Lord, for the day that you've put before us. And of course, we do mean that in the aspect that we woke up and we are here in a yet another 24-hour day. Uh, however, we also thank you, Lord, for the day that you've provided in the sense of the new covenant, Lord, that we live in the new covenant day. Uh, we live in the age to come, and we have these riches, Lord, you've blessed us with. Uh, Lord, we uh, drink of the water of life, and we offer it to others. We nourish ourselves on the root, Lord, the tree of life, and we desire to be used as leaves that are healing the nations. Uh, Lord, go before us in our time. Uh, bless us, Lord, with a fellowship. Bless us with insight. Bless us with joy. And of course, receive our time as praise to you. And uh, of course, we ask that you would bless others through our efforts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our goal here is to fall back to Genesis. And uh, when we fall back to Genesis, there's so much conversation that we can have and, and so many different things that we could be talking about. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I'm excited to kind of get into that missional Monday for me. That's what I call my Mondays is a day where I reorient my mind. You know, I, I begin to, uh, ask myself, what does the Lord want me to focus on for this season, this day, uh, this moment. And, uh, so fall back, falling back to Genesis is actually taking me out of my current studies and bringing me to a whole new study. Uh, for some of us, it might be a continued study. It might be where the Lord's leading you, or as I'm saying this, maybe you're feeling that, you know, the Lord saying, yeah, I want you to focus in on this for this season. So I'm excited to do that. I have a lot that I want to uh, get done during this time. If I might share with you, just as a sort of opening here, um, two things. Uh, the first thing would be uh, a reading from the Common Prayer. I'm just going ahead and digging it up on my screen here. Uh, common Prayer is a uh, practice I do in my personal life. It brings you through an order of prayer. Uh, for those of us that might not always want to just dwell upon our own thoughts. Maybe we need something to pull us out of our own thoughts. Uh, so common prayer uh, serves as a great effort in that. Uh, again, an Anglican resource came out of the Church of England years and years ago. And um, in my estimation, it's a blessed resource. And uh, obviously, I use a more um, 
what would be the right word? Refor- I don't want to say reformed. I use a more, uh, they call it a radical version. It's uh, using more contemporary theologians, sometimes not even theologians, uh, just historic folks as uh, thoughts that would speak to us for the day. However, this morning in the time of common prayer, uh, we were blessed with a thought from Augustine of Hippo. Many of you know he's called a church father. He's a leader from the Christian community in the third century. And uh, this is what he wrote. The times are bad. The times are troublesome. This is what humans say. But we are our times. Let us live well, and our times will be good. Such as we are, such are our times. I thought that was such an interesting thought as per what we bring forth here with preterism, as many often say, well, how can this be the new heavens and new earth if this is what the world looks like? Or uh, how can this be the new heavens and new earth? Or how could we be living in the reality that God had provided post his coming, uh, the resurrection of the dead and the resurrection reality, if you will? How can we be living in this if there's yet a future judgment? Or how can we say that judgment has already occurred? And uh, my response to that would be, you know, very similar with what we just read. Uh, Let's start with the first one. How can this be? the new heavens and new earth. Well, the new heavens and new earth, as per the scripture, was a covenant understanding for the people of God that would provoke them to live out the reality of God. For example, in the Old Testament, you read the beginning of the heavens and earth, and it follows through, which we're going to get a lot in on in this conversation. It follows through with the narrative of Israel. And because that beginning of that heaven and earth, that old heaven and old earth, if you will, was synonymous to their covenant, to their reality what they were bringing forth. And of course, we see the very beginning of that covenant doesn't start out well. Uh, The beginning of their covenant starts out with Adam, Adam sinning and dying, and thus begins this story of Israel being estranged, estranged, I think is the right word, uh, from God, and, uh, you know, disfellowshipped. And uh, we read that narrative just again and again. So we see this picture of judgment and constant judgment because they walk in obstinance or or as a wicked and corrupt generation. We're going to get in on that here in a moment. And um, they, you know, they walk in obstinance and they manifest death. They don't bring forth salvation. They bring forth wind is what the prophet Isaiah says. And thus they hope for a day where they will manifest the light of the the wisdom of God, the light of the Lord, that they will manifest life, that they will manifest, uh, you know, the glories of God and uh, resurrection life. And that's the goal. That's the hope of Israel. So uh, we see this theme in Israel, you know, Jesus becomes the hope of Israel and offers resurrection and life and thus builds up this community that offers resurrection and life called his church and the body of Christ, if you will. So um, that was the first thing. How can we say that we're living in the new heaven and new earth? Well, the every provision for this to be the new heaven and new earth, the new covenant, the new temple. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the work of the new temple to be the, leave, the healing of the nations um, has been provided. So yes, amen. I, I believe we're living in the new heavens and new earth and we are our times. What you focus on is what you what ultimately comes about. The natural man does not understand the things of God. Uh, the spiritual man has the mind of Christ and is spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians chapter two. So the second question would be, how can we say that this is the um, reality of God if we are not yet waiting to be judged? And how can we say we're living in the new heavens and new earth without judgment? Uh, Many of you know, I've taught on this again and again, that uh, and Jesus said it in John 3, Jesus said that those who don't believe in him are condemned already. Those who do believe in him in John, let's say uh, John 6 and 7 and 8, uh, Jesus basically says that those who do believe in him have moved out of death into life, have passed out of judgment. Uh, Those who... uh, what does it say in the famous text? Uh, those who know the truth, the truth will set them free. Uh, that's John 8. So uh, again, the judgment's been rendered. We know the judgment. It's the gospel. It's what Jesus Christ demonstrated through his entire work in the fullness of time. When he was born into this world to redeem the Jews, a picture we see very clearly through his death, burial, and resurrection, and ultimately his coming. And not only to redeem the Jews, but as we read in Romans 15, that that redemption would become a light to the Gentiles, that uh, the Lord would confirm the promises given to his people, redeem them, as you see all throughout the prophets, and then that would become the light to the Gentiles. That would become a beautiful picture. Or um, let me see exactly how Romans 15 says it. It says, uh, 
you know, he became a servant to the circumcision to confirm the promises to the fathers and for the Gentile uh, for and to be a light to the Gentiles. So uh, we see Jesus completing this through all of his uh, efficacious work uh, in the first century. So, uh, yeah, I was just very encouraged by that. We are our times. That's Augustine in the third century taking note of that and uh, encouraging us today. And um, obviously, I believe the futurist effort is very fatalistic and kind of manifests such destruction that they seem to say is uh, going to happen in the future. It's self-fulfilling prophecy and uh, problematic. That being said, I want to go ahead and uh, share with you just a, so the Jewish community, they uh, obviously we talked about Rosh Hashanah, and I want to go ahead and remind you to go back and be reviewing our fall feast resources that we had provided. We went through the, uh, we have the most extensive, and I don't say this to boast in our efforts, I'm boasting in what I know to be edifying. We have the longest list, the best resource in regards to the Feast of the Lord, not because we made it up, but rather it has all the other resources that have been put together in the Preterist community in one place. So you have Pastor Dave Curtis, again, who did an immense work, uh, an amazing work, an edifying work on the Feast of Israel. We have the links for that. And what we did in our blog was we put together each feast by category. So you have Pentecost, you have all the resources for Pentecost. Yeah, and, you know, including our podcast that we did here on the Preterist Power Hour, I want to go ahead and give a shout out to Brother Edward Howell. And he's not with us this morning, but I want to pray that he's having an edifying day and a blessed day. So that being said, we provided those resources and the Jewish community, they've been celebrating these feasts. Digging into that would help you understand uh, the power of preterism, if you will. Uh, another thing that I do that I see the power of preterism very clearly in is a, a reading through the Jewish reading. So each week, the Jewish community has a reading that brings them through the Torah and portions of the prophets. Uh, they call it the Haf Torah. And uh, so every week they're given a Torah reading and then they're given a uh, half Torah prophetic reading or a reading from some of the literature throughout the Old Testament, uh, whether it's the writings, like for example, today, um, this week, we're in the Parshat Ha'adzinu, and Ha'adzinu means listen, and it's actually the first word, that's how the Parshats are, are titled, uh, by the first word of the Parshat, and sure enough, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 1, you read the Song of Moses, and it's listen, and that's the first word, Ha'adzinu, and um, Many of you know, I think it's important to mention this resource. You could go to TorahPortions.ffoz, TorahPortions.ffoz.org. And when you go over there, you can get the, the readings that I'm mentioning right now. You can get the, uh, you can have it read to you audibly. Uh, and then, of course, you can read some commentaries. So I encourage you to do that. This site that I use is a Jewish messianic resource or a messianic Jewish resource. and that means that they believe in Jesus, the Messiah, and they include a New Testament reading. So it's just been very edifying to go through. Uh, this week's readings are Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 1 through 52, the whole chapter there, the whole Song of Moses. Then the half Torah reading is 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 51. And uh, the gospel reading is, and by the way, that's uh, David's song of deliverance. So you read Deuteronomy 32 as a song, you read 2 Samuel 22 as a song, and then the gospel reading is John 6, verses 26 through 35, a beautiful reading of Jesus talking about himself being the bread of life. Uh, you know, when we pray for our daily bread, everything has been given to us pertaining to life and godliness. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come. We're not waiting for the bread to be provided. We're not asking God to provide the bread any longer. We're relishing in what he has provided. That's fulfilled truth, present truth, if you will. And uh, that's the power of preterism. So that being said, um, I want to encourage you to do those readings. But what I want to do is just bring you in on a commentary. Uh, many of you know, I go through Jonathan Sachs. He has a full commentary going through the, uh, the Torah portions. And uh, I was blessed by this. We interviewed Elder Steve Hernandez a couple months ago here on the Preterist Power Hour. And this is one of the resources he blessed me with. He mentioned it and, of course, gave me uh, his, uh, gave me my own edition of it. So last night I went about doing some commentary reading and I found uh, the reading on a warped and twisted generation. And initially I didn't plan to read through the whole thing. Uh, however, 
you know what, I'll probably skip through certain portions, but I'm going to go ahead and give us the most of it so we can all get the gist of what's going on in this uh, Torah portion. In his great concluding song, Moses delivers a visionary overview of Jewish history. God, as we encounter him in the Hebrew Bible, is not a theoretical construct, a first cause who sets the universe in motion and then retires from the affairs of mankind. To the contrary, he is involved in history. He is a God of engagement in the arena of mankind. History to the eye of faith is not what Joseph Heller once called it, a trash bag of random coincidences torn open in the wind. It is instead a drama, a narrative, the story of the covenant, the mutual commitment on the part of Israel to be loyal to God and of God to be the guardian of Israel, leading it in the words of the psalm in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jumping a little bit here. Um, one commentary to these words here in Deuteronomy 32 deserves close attention. It comes from the Net, Netzim, Netzivs, excuse me. In 1854, the Netziv became the head of the Volshin Yeshiva, which under his leadership became a center of Jewish learning in Russia, attracting many outstanding students, among them Rabbi Ak Avram Cook, first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of the pre-state of Israel, the Hebrew poet Hayim Namal Bialek, and Hebrew poet, excuse me, so two folks uh, that became the leader of this uh, group of rabbis called the Net Netziv. The Netziv, well, I'm sorry, the, let me go ahead and read that again. Attracting many outstanding students among them, Rabbi Akram Kuk, first Ashkenazi rabbi priest of Israel, the Hebrew poet Haim Nashan Balik. So this is who this uh, gentleman, the Netziv, that's his name. Uh, he's the Hebrew poet. Um, I'm not appreciating the way Jonathan Sachs wrote this. Either way, uh, the Netziv was a man of immense scholarship and broad horizons. He wrote a commentary. He wrote quite a few commentaries for that matter. And central to his views was the verses of Deuteronomy 32, verses 4 through 5. Central to his understanding of the two verses of, is that they relate to the two great tragedies in ancient Israel, the destruction of the first and second temple. In each case, the first half of the verses refers to the former, the second to the latter. There was, however, a massive dis difference between the two events. Now, if, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to read to you Deuteronomy 32, verses 4 through 5, as he has it outlined here. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faith without iniquity, righteous and upright is he. Is destruction his? No, the blemish belongs to his children, a warped and twisted generation, or many of us know a wicked and perverse generation is the way some of our Bibles are translated the way that Jesus says against the first century generation. Again, building upon, these rabbis are building upon those ancient teachings. So now what it says here was following rabbinic tradition in the plain sense of the prophetic books, the Netziv holds that the Israelites of the first temple period were guilty of cardinal sins, idolatry, murder, and forbidden sexual relations. They had drifted tragically far from the life of Torah. By the time of the second temple, However, many of these faults had been overcome, and we know that so they get out of Babylon, the 70 years in captivity, they begin rebuilding the temple, the second temple period there, and they begin re rebuilding this temple, coming up with traditions leading up to the time of the Messiah, and by the time of the Messiah, we know there were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, I mentioned this in my sermon yesterday here at the Blue Point Bible Church, the various divisions that had come about in the uh, wisdom of the Jews, you, you know, to try to, again, with a good cause. They wanted to fix the problem. Notice what happens here. The Babylonian Talmud attributes the destruction at the hands of the Romans to internal animosities between the Jews. Baseless hatred. The Netziv says candidly that at the time, Jews were occupied with Torah and service of God. However, that led, he says, to bloodshed for the sake of heaven. How so? because they judged anyone who transgressed in any respect to be a Sadducee or a traitor or a heretic, and as a result, their conduct became corrupt. Despite the fact 
that it was for the sake of heaven. That is why they are called a warped and twisted generation, because good and evil were so interwoven in their conduct, and it is difficult to separate good and evil when evil is done in a holy cause. <laughs> you know, uh, obviously the verse comes to mind where they will, they will do this thinking that they will be doing the work of God, right? We read that in the words of Jesus, the words of the apostles. Um, also, you know, you read Jesus's condemnation of that generation in, let's say, uh, Matthew 21 through 23. He's saying exactly this, that they took these traditions and these teachings. You, many of you uh, know I often bring up Mark 9, where it talks about by your traditions, you have invalidated the word of God. That's what happened. He, these Jews had become so divided and so full of hatred. So the sins of the, of the um, children of their father, the devil, as Jesus says in John 8, um, that they began to miss the point of the of their of this covenant that they were given. It was a covenant of death. The apostle Paul explains that for us in Galatians chapter three. So let me continue here with this commentary. In the following verses, Moses uses the phrase, you foolish people and unwise. That's verse uh, 32, six. This too, says the Netziv, refers to the men of the second temple. He cites the Targum, which translates the phrase Am Naval, not as foolish people, but as the people who received the Torah. This is a strange translation. The Netziv explains that the word naval comes from the same root word as navalet, which means unripe fruit, or the incomplete or lesser substitution for something else. Catch the power of that one. That's what the Apostle Paul's building on in Galatians 3. The incomplete, let me read that again. The incomplete or lesser substitute for something else. There is a Midrashic trans. Tra tradition that the Torah is a novelette, it's again another Hebrew phrase here, a substitute for an incomplete version of the divine wisdom. I mean, come on, folks. In other words, God's wisdom, as it is in itself, an infinitely greater than the part of the Torah itself, which he has communicated to human beings. According to the Targum, therefore, the phrase in Ha'adzinu should be read as the people which, though it received the Torah, remained unwise. I'll tell you, if you've been following along in our crazy Corinthian sermon series here at the Blue Point Bible Church, we covered 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3 recently. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about exactly that. Those that had the wisdom of the age, those that had the Torah, had oracles from God, yet were unwise, did not use the, 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 the oracles in any way, were not able to use the oracles in a way that led to righteousness. And... Uh, Continuing here, this says the Netziv was the situation during the days, the last days of the second temple. We have no problem in understanding why the people of the first temple suffered defeat. They were far removed from the Torah, guilty of cardinal sins. However, the men of the late second temple studied and labored in the Torah, which prepares us to be righteous and upright. That is why Moses is so caustic about them, for they remained unwise and were not careful to avoid bad conduct. The tragedy of the second temple period is that some of the worst behavior came from those who were outstanding scholars. Again, this is a Jewish commentary, by the way. I just want you all to hold on to that and know that read, think about some of these things in light of what we believe about Jesus Christ and the Christian and Christianity. They, what did they do to the Christians in that first century? What did these Jews do to Jesus Christ? So again, you see the commentaries, the Jewish commentaries offer it up. They see, you know, they get the, the what is it? A see in a mirror darkly uh, to use that phrase. This is no stray comment on the part of the Netzit. He makes it in several other places in his Torah commentary. However, his clear exposition comes in his preface to the book of Genesis. I'm sure some of you are wondering, why were we talking about this at the beginning of a session that's supposed to fall back to Genesis? Genesis, he notes, the Netzit, is called by the sages Sefer Hayashar, the book of the upright. Why so? Asks the Netzit. Once again, he turns to the phrase in Parshat Ha'atzinim a warped and twisted generation, which again, he applies to the people of the second temple. And I'll read you this portion here. Our explanation is that they were righteous and pious and labored in the, in the Torah, but they were not upright in their dealings with the world. Thus, as a result of the baseless hatred in their hearts, they suspected anyone who did not act in accordance with their opinions of being a Sadducee and a heretic. As a result, they descended to murder and other evils until eventually the temple was destroyed. It is about this that Moses vindicates divine justice. For the Holy One, blessed be he, is upright and does not tolerate righteous people, such as these 
un, um, such as these, unless they act uprightly in their dealings with the world, rather than in a twisted manner, even though their intention is for the sake of heaven. For this causes the ruination of the world and the destruction of society. This, therefore, was the merit of the patriarchs, that beside the fact that they were righteous and pious and loved God to the utmost extent, they were also upright. In their relations with the Gentiles, even with the worst idolaters, they acted out of love and sought their good, for this is what allows the world to endure. Thus we find Abraham, though he, hate his hatred for, he hated their wickedness, prostrating, prostrating himself in prayer for the people of Sodom, for he wanted them to survive. On this, the Midrash Rabbah says, you love righteousness and hate wickedness, Psalm 45, 8. This is what God said to Abraham, namely, you love, your you love to justify your fellow human beings and hate to condemn them as wicked. Similarly, we see how readily Isaac let himself be placated by his enemies, and on the basis of a few apologetic words from Avimelech and his companions, he made peace with them. So we too with Jacob find, find though he knew that Laban sought to destroy him, spoke to him gently on which the Midrash says, better the anger of the patriarchs than the meekness of their children. Thus we learn much from the way the patriarchs conducted themselves with civility. The Netziv's comments are not in themselves exceptional. We find many such remarks by the sages in their reflections on the tragedies that befell the Jews at the hands of the Romans. One such passage used by the Netziv as a proof text is to be found in the Tofsefta, why was Jerusalem at the time of the first temple destroyed? Because of the idolatry, forbidden sexual relationships, and bloodshed that were found therein. But as for the second temple, we recognize that the inhabitants labored in the Torah and were scrupulous in giving tithes. Why then were they exiled? Because they loved money and hated one another, which teaches us that God hates hatred between people, and scripture reckons it equal to idolatry, forbidden sex, and bloodshed combined. The Netziv is usually only in the degree to which he saw the problem as, is unusual only in the degree to which he saw the problem as fundamental. He returned to it time and time again. It is possible in his words to be righteous and pious and to labor in the Torah and yet nonetheless be guilty of twistedness in one's dealing with others indeed to be a part of what the Torah itself calls a warped and twisted generation. This is no minor matter. Because of it, the second temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was reduced to rubble and the Jewish people were condemned to exile. We recognize in the Netziv's words a theme set out with great passion and depth by the prophets. There are failings to which intensely religious people are sometimes prone, namely indifference to the injustices of society, a willingness to overlook corruption within their own ranks, and a tendency to believe that attachment to God relieves one of the duty to be upright, civil, and gracious in one's dealing with other human beings. Two phenomena are often confused, righteousness and self-righteousness. Outwardly, they appear similar, but between them is all the difference in the world. The righteous see the good in people. The self-righteous see the bad. The righteous have high opinions of others. The self-righteous have a high opinion of themselves. The righteous leave us feeling enlarged. The self-righteous leave us feeling diminished. The righteous lift us up. The self-righteous put us down. The Netziv could not have set out alternatives more starkly. The patriarchs of Genesis were generous in their behavior, even to the idolaters. The Torah scholars of the Second Temple, at least some of them, were vicious in their conduct, even toward other religious Jews, and acted as if in any even toward other religious Jews if they acted in any way different from them, treating them as if they were heretics or sectarians. That suggests the Netziv is why we must return again and again to the Tanakh, to Genesis. For though it contains narrative rather than law, it teaches something that cannot be taught by law alone, namely how to behave uprightly in one's dealing with others. Law alone is no defense against self-righteousness. Indeed, law alone can lead to self-righteousness, for it can convince those who study it that the law is on their side. It may be on their side, but the law in and of itself cannot teach us that, other, that the other person is also a human being with feelings that can be injured and with merits that may not be apparent 
to those who view humanity in black and white terms, dividing it, as did the Second Temple sectarians, into the children of light and the children of darkness. Narrative teaches us the complexity of the moral life and the light and shade that can be found in any human personality. Without this, self-righteousness can destroy the very perceptions and nuances, the tolerance and generosity of spirit on which society depends. I mean, talk about a beautiful devotion. <laughs> um, so there's so much to say. The first thing, of course, is that here you have rabbis reading Deuteronomy 32 in light of what we're discussing here in Genesis and the beginning of the, the Torah, the importance of the Torah. They're, they're reading through this Rosh Hashanah reading, again, the end of the year, the beginning of the year for that matter. And they're noting that this relates to the second temple, which we often highlight Deuteronomy 32, second temple, um, the last days. And uh, you have the rabbis noting it for us. And then you have the rabbis noting the, the things that Jesus said to that generation. And then of course, hopefully you caught the application needed for today. We have many, even myself more recently, experiencing some ostracism from a local congregation. We have many that are sectarian in, our, in the church, in our society, and that needs to be marked out. That needs to be ostracized. Ostracism needs to be ostracized. We are allowed to have our own convictions, but we should not be ostracizing other people. So, uh, you know, there's so much to say in that regard, but I hope you caught it. He's, they're bringing us back to Genesis. They're reading Deuteronomy 32, reading, reading this week's reading and bringing us back to Genesis. And interestingly enough, in weeks to come, uh, they begin their weekly reading back at Genesis. So we'll be uh, enjoying some of that in our falling back to Genesis here on the Preterist Power Hour. So now that I shared all of that and get kind of hopefully helped you understand where I'm at in understanding all of this. Yes, I love the doctrine, but I also believe there needs to be an orthopraxis. Uh, I want to go ahead and share with you just a thought I shared in my book, Wicked, and then I'll share with you a host of other resources and maybe even welcome some conversation from those that are here with us. So in Wicked, I said this, the failure of the church to properly categorize the Genesis creation account, that's Genesis chapters one through three, as a covenant creation gives further evidence to our confusion regarding identifying wickedness. In the midst of a wicked, chaotic creation, God establishes a people for himself, or in a more theological manner, we say he covenanted with his people. It is this covenant creation, which comes to be known as Israel, that is given the glory and responsibility of being God's image on earth. His people will bear his name. We read of Adam's fall from grace, wherein he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and therefore suffers death, not necessarily because he ate of the tree, but because he violated the command of God. From that point forward, death characterized God's covenant people, and the wickedness was seen as an inherent issue. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament. So um, if I might let you know, uh, I have a host of details about covenant creation. I have a blog on my personal site, Miano Gone Wild. Uh, if you go there, you can plug in covenant creation, and you'll get a host of blogs. Uh, one particularly called the Intro to Covenant Creation. I give you a, a link for the book Beyond Creation Science that you could either purchase a hard copy or you could download a PDF for free. Um, thanks, Jeff Wan, Tim Martin, for that resource and, of course, for making it free. Uh, then I also provide a host of other links that have been made available. There's a Facebook group called Covenant Creation Discussion Forum that I'm a part of. I'm also a part of the group called Preterism and Creation so uh, there's a host of different ways to engage that online. Uh, we had went through preterism in Genesis actually twice. So I have two blogs for you. One uh, called Preterism, Genesis, and Creation. Um, then I have another one that's continuing conversation, study of preterism in Genesis. So, uh, and those, of course, as many of you know, my resources are full of resources. So if you just go to those two links, you'd be given a blessed amount of information. So I encourage you to kind of catch up if you've reviewed those, reviewed those sessions. I know some of you have been here with me for the Preterist Power Hour as we interviewed men like Jeff, Dr. Jeff Vaughn, Tim Martin, Randy Nuss, and um, we're going to continue to hear from them. We're going to be bringing them into some of our conversations. We might uh, go off course of our Monday and Friday and maybe even have some diff different interviews scheduled during the weeks. Um, and again, this is going to be a whole fall uh, focus here. 
Matter of fact, another thing we're going to be bringing out this fall, uh, many of you know, if you visit timmartinteaches.wordpress.com, that's where I've been uploading Tim Martin sermons that he had preached uh, years back at the Covenant Community Church in Whitehall, Montana. And um, what I've done is I've obtained those sermons, praise be to God, and uh, we're uploading them. Now, I had originally said I was going to upload them every Saturday, uh, unfortunately, and I apologize. I kind of stepped back on that and uh, didn't intend to do so. However, life happened. I got married. I you know, got a bunch of things going on. However, um, I do plan to get back to that. My goal by the end of fall is to have all the sermons uploaded. And uh, we'll organize them in a way that you can go by sermon series and be blessed by the different resources. Um, Tim will be kind of helping us understand how he would want us to best be blessed by his resources. And uh, we'll be bringing him on and having more conversation with him uh, as this is the season where he can uh, have some conversation in this regard. Speaking of seasons, we missed out on talking about these things on uh, the heretics. You know, I just noticed uh, they just finished like a week ago. Uh, the heretics is a program that uh, happens probably about twice a month and they come together on uh, social media, a group of guys and uh, guys and women, and they come together and they talk through certain theological topics. Uh, and I, I had the privilege, matter of fact, on uh, June 23rd of uh, this year to be a guest on their program and share about covenant creation. I'll make sure I share the link with you on our blog for today, uh, and you'll be able to go back and review some of the things I said there. Um, not so much the podcast itself, but the notes I wrote after the podcast uh, to help you understand. They don't record the sessions. Uh, it's just for honest banter and discussion. So uh, I'll share with you my notes and my presentation, uh, a link for that. But I'm going to lean in on them as well. So, you know, Joe Parrott and uh, many of the guys that were involved with the heretics, I'm hoping to bring them on and have them bless us today with some insight, uh, not today, have us bless us during the season with some insights that they had gained and where they're at in their study of these things. And maybe we'll have some funny little graphics from them uh, in their programs that I'll be sharing during the fall season. So uh, that's that regard. Um, Elvin Israel, we had him on the program a couple times talking about the Feast of the Lord, talking about preterism, talking about some debates that he was participating in. He published a book on Genesis 1. The book is called The Circumcision and Uncircumcision of Genesis 1, The Mysteries of the Garden Revealed. So uh, we're going to be uh, talking with him and uh, bringing him on, maybe reviewing the book, writing a review of the book, talking about some of the details in the book. So you could expect that to happen in the next couple months. Uh, Jeff Vaughn recently spoke uh, at the 2022 Spirit and Life Lectures, and sure enough, his topic was covenant creation. Uh, some of you know that we had, uh, we had some discussion with Holger regarding the conference, but we didn't really lean in on the covenant creation topic. So um, what I'm hoping to do is kind of get a handle on that conversation maybe even allowing Jeff to further detail uh, his response to that. And if anything, maybe bringing Holger on and having Holger talk with him and uh, Jeff and uh, us and, and see what things we can mark out as beneficial from that conversation. So uh, I'm always trying to kind of keep my eye on these different conversations and see what truths can be immersed, you know, or what truths can be unearthed, to use that phrase appropriately. Um, I'm looking to have other interviews and discussions. You know, I think of a, a brother named David that's been doing some videos on Facebook he, uh, he's been putting together some thoughts and kind of sharing them with us. And I was blessed this morning. I listened to some and I was like, wow, man, he gets it. He's teaching it really well. So uh, I'll be entertaining some thought with him, conversation with him. Maybe he'll join with us here for a Preterist Power Hour and uh, share where he's at. And we can encourage him uh, to continue on in that regard. Um, there's so many other names. Frank Phoebus, he's written a lot about creation in the covenantal fashion, uh, many of you know Dr. John Walton. A lot of these more popular teachers have taught these things as well. Um, so we can, there's so much to learn from and so many resources to lean in on. I, I've done all these blogs. So I've pretty much put out all my resources. So what I'm hoping uh, to continue the conversation is that those of you that are listening, those of you that are following along, um, that you might say, well, this is somebody that I think needs to be interviewed. This is a resource that I want to hear a response from. This is a question that I have. And uh, that'll help us continue this conversation throughout the whole fall season. So, uh, you know, I, I thank those that have continued to contribute. Uh, I will be keeping my eye on those two Facebook groups that I mentioned, uh, Preterism and Creation and Covenant Creation Discussion Forum uh, to gain topics and different things that are happening. Uh, hopefully we'll foster some conversation in those groups as well. And uh, yeah, that, that's, you know, that's where I'm at with uh, the bunch of resources in regards to covenant creation. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead. I know I have a group here with me, so I'll unmute some mics. I know I mentioned a lot. 
If there's any questions or comments or concerns or things you want to bring up in regards to this conversation about, uh, and again, we're, we're getting closer to the end of the show here. So uh, whatever we can uh, just kind of highlight and talk about and sum up, that would be great. And we'll be continuing this conversation through the fall season. Hello. Hey, Derek, what's going on? Not too much. I'm in South Florida here. I got my cat. I got his little harness on and his leash. Probably going to go over to my next door neighbor's house, Gary, and hang out with him. Maybe eat some tater tots and hang out with the cat. <laughs> oh, sounds like a good day to me. All right. So uh, you've been following along, brother. What are your thoughts in this conversation about uh, preterism? And, you know, again, we're speaking to an audience that already understands the preterist hermeneutic. So now we're saying, what about Genesis? Where do you stand in that? Well, I was just texting David Gates because I had a conversation with him quite some time ago, and he had mentioned, I thought, something about write, wanting to write a book on covenant creation, and I just texted him, and he, he just cut me off. He said, no, I don't know why. Maybe it's just, maybe I caught him at a bad time or something, but I've only spoken with him a couple of times, and I've spoken with you about covenant creation and how I kind of interpret it. You want me to just try to put it together in like three or four minutes out of Genesis yeah. 1? Yeah, tell me where you're at. Okay, so I use the idiom of heaven and earth in the first verse of the Bible, just as it is in uh, Matthew 24, I believe. You know, heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus' words would never pass away. So if we have the first heaven and earth mentioned in the whole Bible, that's considering all of existence. I look at it as kind of that relationship. When I hear heaven and earth together from Isaiah 66 and 1, the heaven is my earth throne, the earth is my footstool. I see a relationship of the ruling over the ruled, the authority over that which is subservient, you know, so the first heaven and earth on planet earth would likely be more chaotic. There were human beings primarily on heaven, on, on planet earth were hunter gatherer types. They were not sophisticated that, you know, they didn't, the earth of that, the subjugation was without form and void. Their minds were void, you know, and they were not organized. They didn't have society and cities. You know, things like that on planet Earth. Again, they were hunter-gatherer types. So you got that heaven and earth, the first one ever mentioned in Genesis 1 and 1 through 3. The earth was without form and void. Our societies weren't there. Our minds were void. And God said, let there be light. We got this illumination, communication, sophistication, you know, all that stuff. So then uh, you, go, you can even fast forward to John 1 and 4, and you got Jesus referring back to god saying let there be light it says in him was the life speaking of the word which was with god and was god in him was the life and the life was the light of men when god said let there be light you know and men became more sophisticated so that's kind of how i look at it yeah i appreciate your your uh, outline there and yes i i kind of take a similar approach now we know that in the early couple centuries of the church right there was a man named origin and he began to see a lot of these algorizing, you know, uh, things in scripture. And it obviously frustrated the church. There were some that disagreed with him. I even disagreed with Origen in some points. However, what we're saying is when you become familiar with the way this language is used and you go back to Genesis, it's not a haphazard effort. It's not forcing things in there. But again, it's, you know, really unearthing what Genesis is saying, right? So you see this covenant picture, this, uh, I believe, and I, I, from what I gather, you believe this as well, Derek, that Genesis is apocalyptic and prophetic. So uh, it's revealing something, right? That apocalyptic phrase there. And it's prophetic that it's pointing to something uh, greater than itself, you, you know, uh, which again, I think the entirety of the law, putting Genesis within its context, the law of Moses, uh, I believe that was the point of prophetic to the things of Jesus Christ, to be apocalyptic regarding uh, the unveiling of the mystery that would happen in the first century. That square away with some of the things you see in Genesis 1, Derek. Well, I kind of look at it like this, too. I take it all the way to the parable of the prodigal son. I would say the prodigal son is Israel. Mm -hmm. Of those who, you know, when Adam is kicked out of the garden, you know, God's people sins, right? So they want to, so mankind goes out and lives it up and eats with the pigs. And then Jesus comes to earth to restore Eden, Hmm. And, and, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests and the scribes, they're the older brother of the prodigal son parable. Mm -hmm. And they rest upon the laurels of their fathers. We are of Abraham. We are of Moses. So, again, I look at it as Israel as a whole is 
the prodigal son and the older brother. I look at it that way, kind of. All right, yeah, I can go for that. Um, I think there's a lot that could be unearthed through those correlations you're making, but uh, I, I've heard similar, and I think you're you're on the good track. Zach, I see you are muted. Did I? Could I have you jump in and, and share some thoughts? Hey, yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to um, confess that I'm jealous of Derek's tater tots this morning, but right. um, uh, other than that, uh, I, I yeah, I there's actually I just finished this morning. There's an an interesting interview, um, and this is on the resource tip of uh, Jordan Peterson, who's sort of, you know, a famous um, sort of scholar and cultural critic right now. He, he was interviewing um, a writer named Matthew Pajo, who just wrote a book called The Language of God, and it has to do with the interpretation of Genesis 1. Um, and he's interpreting it in, it's a little bit, it's not exactly covenant creation. It, it, it's more, uh, psychologizing in the sense of talking about the development of the human being as being, um, development of the human psyche as being the uh, being reflected in um, Genesis. Um, but he also talks about, you know, Genesis providing us with sort of a biblical language um, that is going to help us, you know, interpret the rest of scripture. Um, and that the same, you know, the Genesis 1 context of the different um, elements of Genesis 1, like Derek pointed out, like the light and, um, you know, the water and the earth and what those will symbolize as, you know, elements of a language that is going to be used to, um, the language is going to be used for the rest of scripture, which I think is actually, you know, correct. I think if you, I think you probably synthes synthes synthesize that um, view with covenant creation in the sense that, you know, the covenant is going to be the language that's going to be used throughout the rest of scripture. Um, so I just thought it was a, it's a pretty interesting and sort of salient conversation, um, to what we're talking about now. And, uh, I haven't read the book yet, but I intend to. But it's interesting to see that this is this conversation is also sort of in um, sort of going on in the broader culture, even outside of you know our somewhat smaller you know circle. Um, and a lot of people are coming to the same you know sort of conclusions as we are. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was pretty interesting, and I I you know, suggest that as, that as a resource. Appreciate that. I might follow up with you and uh, ask for the name and, and everything in that regard. Um, and, yeah. and make a post of, well, well, obviously we'll be creating an ongoing resource that'll be used as a part of our Falling Back to Genesis program here. So um, thanks, Zach. And yeah. uh, if I might say, uh, what I see you and Derek leaning in on a bit there is that imagery of uh, chaos, right? With the waters and uh, and formless and void, the tohu va bohu uh, thing mm -hmm. there. There's a lot to be said and kind of like a picture. I think this is so important. You know, what we see with a lot of these details in scripture is a picture. So, you know, when you look at a picture, there's going to be different pieces that stand out to you at different points. And, you know, there, you know, depending on your own personal mood, you know, we hear things, we see things different. We might dare I say we feel things different depending upon the mood we go into them with. So that being said, with Genesis, you know, I want to encourage us be comfortable with the different moods, quote unquote, uh, to look at and, and kind of examine, you know, um, there's a lot going on in this very small portion, you know, uh, of Genesis. So uh, I, I appreciate that, Zach, and I will be uh, kind of, my goal is to, you know, kind of open my horizons here to the different moods, you know, to use that phrase, I might continue using that, um, that, you know, that can be taken on when looking at Genesis. So, you know, there's going to be times where Genesis is focused in on Israel, there's going to be times where Genesis, I do believe, you know, for example, if I might answer a common misconception 
uh, right now would be many people think that covenant creation is talking about Israel only. Okay, uh, let me clarify, in my view at least, uh, and I've exhausted this in discussion and debate, that the word covenant itself implies that when God blesses a people, he's blessing people beyond them. That's why he covenants. God is a God who blesses a people to bless a people. Nothing in scripture, you'll never see a time where God just did something for that very real, that very blessing. His blessings are always blessing those outside. Uh, it's always intended to be that way. When it, It's when it becomes myopic that that's where you can say God's not in there. So I say that because covenant creation is not only about Israel. Covenant, God covenanted with Israel to the effect of the nations, that he would bless the nations. So I just wanted to, I hear people say that a lot of times and I get frustrated because I'm saying, no, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, even from the very minute of Genesis 1, you might say the nations are in mind. So, you know, uh, hopefully I'm, I'm you helping you see different perspectives to looking at Genesis uh, that can be had. Then we talk about the mind, right? And we talk about, uh, I know John Walton leads a lot in on um, talking about function. I, and I know Derek mentioned that briefly, uh, function and non-functional or useless. And uh, some of these details we see in Genesis one through three. So yeah, I, I say that Zach to respond to some of the things you said, and I appreciate the resource that you'll be, uh, that you mentioned there. Yeah, great. And yeah, and I mean, Israel itself is saying something about humanity. I mean, we're not, it's not as though if, when we're talking about Israel, we're, it's necessarily confined simply to that nation because Israel is, is standing as, you know, this representative of humanity in the Bible. I, I think at least that's how I would see it is so, and you know, Adam acting as a um, sort of the microcosm of Israel, he's also saying something about humanity as a whole. It's just, um, it's doing it within this certain context. Yeah, I agree. Would you agree with me saying that Israel serves as a mirror to the nations? Yeah, and, absolutely. And you might say it's, it's funny, it's a weird mirror because it's, Israel serves as a mirror to the nations and the nations serve as a mirror to Israel you know, because Israel is supposed to be bringing forth salvation. And if they look at the nations and the nations are a disaster, which they were, uh, it's clear to say that, well, now we've, we're clearly a disaster as well, which I believe that was the point that they manifested death because that was what that was what that covenant highlighted was death, which the apostle Paul details in Galatians three. So um, I think it's three, three or four, uh, three and four for that matter. But uh, yeah, so I would agree with you. And I think using that they're at the center. They're the mirror. Israel serves as a mirror of the nations in many regards. Amen. Yeah. Vicki, I see you're unmuted. Did you have some thoughts you wanted to jump yeah, in? And yeah, uh, sir. I want to contribute this verse. Jesus said, I came to heal the sick, not the well, not the people that are healthy. Right. So, so in our covenant study, uh, the people, you know, either have no salvation or the people uh, uh, in their custom or whatever, you make certain imagination and, and, and come up with something that is not healthy. That is why the Lord came to heal the sick and not the healthy. Yeah, I see what you're saying there uh, with in regards to those phrases. And that, that's why. You know, even in light of what I shared from Jonathan Sachs, hopefully you saw that correlation there that, you, you know, the Jews, they thought they were the healthy ones and that yeah. Jesus was someone else. But meanwhile, he was speaking to them that they were the unhealthy ones. So, yeah. But yeah. Do you think this verse is very beautiful, you know? Sure. I, I think that's a text that could be, you know, that's another one of those texts that we could talk about probably all program. So, um, and <laughs> perspectives to what it's saying contextually to israel contextually in regards to the covenant and even applicationally for us today yeah yeah that's true vicky would you say you you generally understand and agree with covenant creation yes yes okay. i understand i understood a lot but i cannot I, I i don't know how to verbalize it right yeah you've been a part of quite a few of our studies here at the church and online you know so. i've been I have been with you, Pastor, for years and years, you know. 
Yeah, almost a decade, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, and then we study day by day, week by week, years by years, and I ask many questions. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, actually, if I might add something to that, you know, if I might share a personal tidbit here. Um, so when I first was called to Blue Point almost 10 years ago now, uh, when I was first called to Blue Point, the, one of the questions that was asked, actually asked to me during my, you know, my interview was, do I hold to covenant creation? And at that time, that was about, you know, three or four years after the book Beyond Creation Science, one of the editions, maybe the main edition, first edition, uh, was published. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of controversy in the preterist community about covenant creation and what Beyond Creation Science was saying. And, you um, yeah, so my response, my initial response was, well, I, I haven't read the book fully through yet. I believe a lot of what they're saying and what it seems to be pointing out. However, I don't, you know, I'm not a hook, line and sinker covenant creationist. You know, I, I've seen some wacky things said here and there on the discussion forums. So I wasn't quite sure. And uh, so then my, when I got here to Blue Point, I got called. Uh, they, um, we, we began an effort of reading through and studying through Beyond Creation Science. Now, 10 years later, I think we've studied through it at least three times, twice in person and once online. And, um, you know, we studied through it. And now I think we've kind of developed that we would definitely be class. I know I am classified as a covenant creationist. And we've also realized that there's a couple of different views within the covenant creation community. Some we agree with as a congregation, some we disagree with, some that we agree with maybe personally and maybe disagree with each other, but uh, there's a lot to be said. And I just thought it was very interesting to highlight the, the, the uh, patience that Blue Point Bible Church had with me and was willing to journey with me. And I know, you know, that didn't come without contention. Uh, there were some times where I was at Bible studies and it was like, well, if we say that then, and yeah, then it requires a little bit of study. And, you know, we, we did that work. So I'm very grateful for the, the fellowship. And of course, the online community, uh, I've seen the same thing there. So Vicki, thank you for being a part of that. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring us to a close. Uh, I know we started a little late, but we also ran a little bit late here. So I think we're close to our end of our hour. Uh, I want to give each of you that are here a moment. Did you, is there anything you want to mention as we're falling back to Genesis that you feel I need to be keeping in mind or that you want me to keep in mind as we're moving forward? All uh, right. Continue, I think. All right. Just keep going with what I got going on, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you, Vicki. And um, again, you know, if there's things that come to mind as you further study, Zach, I, I, I might encourage you, let's get to reading that book this season if you can. And uh, I look forward to uh, maybe I'm, I'm urging you a bit beyond what you were planning, but uh, I'd love to dig in with you and learn from you in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll I'll try to get that done. We'll see. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm the guy that challenged my church to read the, you know, the congregation here to read the Bible in 90 days, and you got to watch me sometimes. Um, but uh, hopefully, give you the encouragement. I look forward to your thoughts. Um, well, that being said, I'm going to wrap up our time here. Uh, I thank you for being a part of our session this morning. Uh, those of you that are tuned in online, I see we've got a good, healthy audience there. And then, of course, those of you that are here with me in this session. Uh, our next planned program is this Friday at 1030. So we'll definitely be here this coming Friday at 1030. I will work on some interviews and discussions and different things, which usually take us outside of our allotted times that we have now. And I'll keep everybody informed. Um, I try not to do that with at least two or three days notice. So um, again, we have a host of different things that we're going to look forward to. Uh, I already mentioned on this program alone, resources that can probably keep you busy through the whole fall. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to go and visit the blog that we'll post later today, uh, which will be falling back to Genesis. Um, and uh, we'll have all the resources that I mentioned, and uh, we'll create a sort of ongoing resource uh, there for everyone's edification. Two last things I might mention this morning to you. Well, first three, let me say three. First thing would be, uh, I hope you have a missional Monday. And remember that quote I shared with you at the beginning there about uh, from Augustine of Hippo, where he said that we are our times. We have work to do. You know, the world's a mess. And, and you know, the, the, the Christian world's a mess. The Christian community sometimes tends to reek of Pharisaic first century confusion and, uh, you know, in many regards, whether it's futurism, whether it's the attitude, uh, whatever it might be. So I hope that uh, we would engage our society, we, that we would continue to be those who shine the light of life that Derek mentioned, the light of the Lord, and help others get a better handle on it. Uh, that being said, two resources I'll bring up for you in closing. Uh, one is Preterist Voice Magazine. 
Uh, all you simply have to do, go to your email, put in subscription at fulfilledmedia.com. Send the email over and they'll add you to the email list. And uh, or if you don't want to e get it on your email, you can just go to fulfilledmedia.com. Look for magazine, Preterist Voice magazine, and you can read the articles. This past uh, the early bird edition was published a couple of days ago. And uh, my article from 2014 called The Vow of Praise was included. So I encourage you to go and check out my article, Don Preston's article, Frank Daniels article, and a host of other uh, resources that are mentioned in that magazine for your edification. Lastly, and I'll share these links, by the way, on the, uh, on the blog for today so you can get them as well. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is my wife and I, Rashonda, have begun our podcast. So we just published our first one. You can expect them on Fridays. We published our first one this past weekend. And uh, the name of our blog is You've Got Mail, The Pastor and the Mail Lady. And uh, of course, it's a lifestyle blog. It's a relationship blog. It's a relationship a, a blog about god and then our you know the bible our church our reality as the church and uh, so much more so you know i could go on and on brag on my wife brag on that podcast but i encourage you when we post the link go ahead click on it uh give us the view of course and then also uh, be blessed by what we brought forth uh thank you for being here with me this morning as i mentioned i participate in a common prayer session every monday morning at 10 a.m you can join with us same zoom session same call number uh however I'm just going to close our session this morning with the benediction that we read in the common prayer. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. God bless and go in peace. And I look forward to talking with you, all of you a bit more on Friday morning at 1030. Take care.